Okay, thank you, Jens. Uh, I'm Johan van Slembroek. I'm a consultant for Capgemini, uh, Capgemini Engineering in Belgium. Until end of March, we were uh, Altran. And Altran was a, was a company of engineers of all uh, disciplines. So it's uh, logical to rebrand re uh, Altran as Capgemini, in Capgemini Engineering. I'm from the Flemish part of uh, Belgium. So that's my, why my name sounds more German than French. Uh, this is going to be the menu for today. So first, uh, so we have nine courses. First is a short introduction to Corolli. What is Corolli? Then a very brief introduction to C++ coroutines, only four slides. So if you know coroutines already in advance, uh, it's going to be a short repetition of what coroutines are. If you are, don't know coroutines yet, that uh, brief introduction is too short to explain you in detail what coroutines are, but it should give you an idea. And it should be sufficient to follow this presentation, even if you don't know uh, coroutines in advance. Uh, then an introduction to asynchronous and synchronous distributed programming, because it's going to be the, the main lead of today the difference between those styles, so that's four stats. Then uh, one main course, why using coroutines for distributed programming? So that's already 27 slides in total. In fact, that's uh, uh, this is going to be the main course. So it's more about why using coroutines. It's more a promotion of coroutines, this presentation, than a, co than a prom uh, promotion of my own library, which follows next. Um, so, uh, point five is a little bit on coroutines, the goals that I intended and the coding style. Then uh, the coroutine organization, what you can find in Corolli. Uh, five slides about the examples that you can also find on the web. Uh, then some related work and uh, finally uh, conclusion. So, it's right. So, what is Corolli? So, uh, what does Google say? Google says that Coral is an island somewhere in the Pacific, Pacific Ocean. Um, it's at an elevation of 20 meters, important to know. And it's better known as Goat Island or Coral Reef Island. That's a map and it's very difficult to find. It's even not on the map because it's so small that it's not indicated on the map. So uh, if you want to see more pictures of uh, Coral Reef, you could go to or you could Google this one. Coro and uh, we'll get more pictures of uh, Coro Libre. Uh, Co Coro Libre is also a repository on GitHub, and that's the, to the, the topic of this evening. So it's a C++ coroutine library for developing asynchronous distributed applications. And uh, you could have guessed that uh, Coro Libre is just short for uh, coroutine library. Uh, here you have the link and follow it with the GitHub. So it uh, contains all examples and the additional documentation for this presentation. So this presentation is just short for you what you can find in, uh, on GitHub. Uh, it's uh, one person outside working hours hobby projects. So it's uh, written by me, outside working hours because uh, I never spent anything uh, during clients hours. Um, and it's a hobby project. And some people have weird hobbies, and I'm uh, one of them. Uh, but it's uh, one of also of my objectives of 2022 for uh, Gemini Engineering. So they know that I'm busy with it, and uh, I want to promote both coroutines uh, and uh, this library. Uh, you find a variant, Corolip, with a hyphen in between. That's another repository on GitHub. Uh, that's a repository for deep learning and numerical modeling resources for COVID-19. Uh, so this one is short, I guess, for, Coro, uh, for Corona Library. Mm -hmm. And that's the recommended. So this presentation is going to be on not on the islands, I have to disappoint you, but on this uh, repository on GitHub. So, that's a little bit uh, of Corolip uh, in perspective. So this is Corolip, and it's attended as a small layer on top of existing uh, 
asynchronous communication middlewares like Boost ASIO, Build 5, uh, Network NTS, and uh, any proprietary asynchronous uh, communication framework that you may have encountered. Um, I have an implement, I have an interface for Boost. I have one for Qt API. I don't have an interface for that proprietary asynchronous communication framework, and I don't have an, uh, an interface for Network NTS. That's why I use uh, this parenthesis here. Um, originally, I wanted to use Boost ASIO because Boost also has an implementation of coroutines. So there's no need to use Corolip as, a, as an interface on top of Boost ASIO if you want to use coroutines because Boost ASIO has already an implementation of it. And my first intention was to learn coroutines from the implementation in Boost ASIO. But that was a little bit too complex for me uh, to understand how it worked. So that's why I started myself with small uh, snippets of code. And uh, eventually it has evolved into this library uh, that I can use on top of uh, Boost ASIO. Also, one of the goals is to keep it, uh, to keep coroutines separate from any asynchronous communication framework uh, so that you can put on top of it, uh, so that you don't have to extend the communication framework but uh, that you can use and just can add coroutines on top of it. Um, that's about all for this small introduction. Next slide. Yeah. That's an introduction to coroutine itself. Uh, coroutine is a general generalized routine that in addition to the traditional subroutine operations invoke and call or invoke or call and return or suspend and resume operations. So everybody knows functions. You can call a function, the function will return. Well, coroutines have two things in, uh, in addition, and that's a suspend and a resume operation. Mm -hmm. So more in practical, how do you recognize a coroutine? Well, a coroutine is a function with one of those things in the, uh, inside the code. It's either a coroutine sta uh, a core return statement to return from a coroutine. Uh, you can't use just uh, return. You have to use core, uh, core return if you want to return from a coroutine. You will often find also co await expression uh, that uh, conditionally suspends evaluation of that coroutine while waiting for a computation to finish. If that computation has already finished, then you will uh, resume. Otherwise, you will suspend your coroutine by calling. Uh, we also have a co-yield expression. Uh, that's something that I don't use in Corolip. In Coro so there's no examples in Corolip itself. Um, and it's, but it's used in combination with uh, generators. We have a range-based for loop that uses coroutines, uh, co -weight, so it's a uh, like it this. So we will find examples of co-return and co-weight in uh, core dependent in the code that we uh, If you have a function that uh, has a co-return or a co-weight or a co-yield, you also need a, a special return type. So you just can't uh, return an int or a void or a double that we know from the past. It must have a special return type uh, that's a coroutine type. And that's something that you have to, to develop yourself. So that's something that I have developed for uh, the core, core, core Here are some more definitions. Uh, if you know coroutines, then you must have to account this already. Uh, the coroutines in C++ are stackers. Uh, we also have stackful coroutines. Uh, Boost has two implementations of stackful coroutines. Uh, stackful coroutines, you don't need uh, to implement stackful coroutines, you don't need support from the compiler. While uh, in contrast, for stackless coroutines, you need support from the compiler. So that's uh, uh, those stackless coroutines like in C are only available from C20 uh, because only C20 compiler supports stackless coroutines. Uh, you will also, also find uh, Suspend resume point, initial suspend resume point, it's at the beginning of your coroutine. Something that you don't see as a user, you have a final suspend resume point. Also, that you don't see as a user uh, in the code of your coroutine. 
and some more definitions, readable type. That's the type that supports the cool read operator. Reader type, that's type that uh, implements three special methods that are part of the cool read expression. A read ready, a read suspend, a read resume. You have other terms like coroutine state, coroutine uh, frame, a coroutine object, object coroutine handle, and so on. And then you have the promise type, also something that uh, you have to implement if you want to write a coroutine handle. And then you have the generator, that's a coroutine that provides a sequence of values. So that's a lot of terms for somebody who has never seen coroutines. But uh, if you learn about them, you will account for each of these terms that we are present here in this class. Um, I made small comparisons between function, coroutine, thread, and, um, and process. Um, everybody knows functions and processes. When I first learned about threads, it was something um, magical to me. It was like something in between a function and a process. And then when I learned about coroutines, that was also something magical, but it was something in between a function and a thread. And I first read about it. So uh, what I've done is uh, put some uh, yes and no questions. And uh, this way you can make a diagonal here on this one. But uh, if you ask the correct questions, on one side of the diagonal you will find no answers. On the other side you have Yes, answers. So this way, that's a way of comparison functions, coordinates, threads, and processes. I'm not going over this slide. You can see it later. Um, then another question: Is there native support in C++? Yes, of course, for functions and for processes. Uh, for threads, it's native support in C++ 11, and for coordinates, it's uh, since C++ 19. So you need a recent compiler if you want to experiment with coroutines. Next, type in the menu. That's the major course for this evening. Uh, no, not this one. First, a brief introduction to distributed programming. Uh, so that's my definition. A distributed system is a set of communicating programs are running on computers or computer nodes in a network. I guess everybody can live with this definition uh, for this presentation. There are some communication architectures like client server, and my examples are basically client server of, uh, examples that I use. Uh, I have a history and background in Corba, so I'm still influenced a little bit by Corba uh, in what I'm doing. Uh, I'm also a fan of privilege subscribe architectures like you have in DDS, data distribution service, or in ROS, the robot operating system, or in UARM that's used in, uh, in drone software. Uh, I found more uh, reason of, to write coroutines on client server applications and for privilege subscribe. So I have uh, only have, uh, examples of Lines, the client server applications that I use in, in combination with coroutines, not yet of previous subscribe, or at least not at the big extent. Then we have some programming styles, remote method invocation, uh, or if we just use functions, remote procedure call, uh, message communication, which is at a lower level because the RMI, remote method invocation, is always implemented in, in, in terms of messages one message going in one, in one direction, and then the other message going uh, in the other direction. We have protocol stacks, TCP IP. So what I'm using is uh, TCP IP programming so that I, my TCP application, uh, I run them on uh, one machine, uh, just using TCP IP like back. But you could use Bluetooth, USB, and so on. Something about synchronous versus asynchronous communication because that's going to return all of this presentation. Um, so when we talk about synchronous, asynchronous, uh, the word chronos in, is in there. That's a Greek word for time. So I've seen many definitions or 
of uh, synchronicity or asynchronous applications, but nobody explains what they mean, especially not uh, in terms of time. So uh, synchronous means at the same time, asynchronous is not at the same time. So in terms of synchronous communication, mapping to what it could be, what it could mean in terms of time, that uh, to me it means that an entity waits internally for information from other entities or from an environment. If it does wait internally, then we have a synchronous communication. So with internally, I mean inside the application itself or inside a library or a framework that is called from the entity. So waiting for information from the address kind of synchronization. So if you wait for the response to a request, uh, or if you wait until the other application starts processing your request, that's a kind of uh, synchronous communication. Uh, it's a natural start for remote method applications because those remote method applications, they look uh, the same as a local method application. So there's sometimes no difference at all between a remote method application and a local method application. So that means you can write programs with both mixed both the local methods or the local functions that you call or remote functions. You don't even have to care about. Uh, it's the same style. It's a fast way of writing code. Uh, very natural to write it like that way. But it's, uh, it has one big disadvantage, and that's those applications. So while waiting for a response from the other, your application cannot respond to the other inputs that it may receive. And for some systems, but it's just a little bit annoying because you have a slight delay. But in other applications, it's totally unacceptable. So people have been looking for different uh, solutions for that. And one solution that you find is the use of asynchronous communication, where your entity cannot wait inside internally for information from other entities or from its environment. So this way, there's no obvious communication between applications and the system because you never wait. You just uh, receive a, a request from the environment or from another application. You do your thing. Uh, you send out the request to somebody else. And then you return to a central point where the application can, uh, can act to, uh, to new events from the environment or from other entities. So this way, we have, again, restored the activity. Your application will always be ready to accept inputs from others, either solicited, that means you just send a request and then you wait for the response, or unsolicited, that means uh, you just wait for somebody to ask you to send you a request. Um, but for the, uh, implementing RMIs, it's a very unnatural implementation, but we will see with examples coming later in this. Uh, So that's the definition of synchronous and asynchronous using the concept of time. Now, there's a possible solution to solve the reactivity problem, and that's uh, to run RMIs on a dedicated grid. So suppose you have a very complex algorithm with uh, RMIs, you have implemented it in a synchronous way, but you see that your application cannot respond to others. So one possibility is to run that complex uh, algorithm on a separate thread, and then you have another thread that you can respond to, to inputs uh, from the environment. And in many occasions, that's a good approach. It will, so it will be sufficient. You don't have to cut up your, your uh, original application into this asynchronous application. Uh, so if that solution is sufficient for you, uh, you don't even have to look maybe at core things as a solution because you don't have even have problems with the, the implementation of the asynchronous applications. Uh, of course, with threads, you can have problems. If you have multiple threads, you have to communicate. You have shared variables. Uh, these are all things you have to deal with. If you don't want to use threads and you still want to have an uh, asynchronous application style, uh, but with a natural style, then you should have a look at the And that's something we will see in the next points. Um, 
one problem also with Acer Corona stars is that you have so many of them. So um, with the synchronous style, there's only one. That's the remote method integration. Looks like a uh, normal method integration locally. But with uh, asynchronous styles, I have seen so many, and uh, there are probably many that I have not seen yet. So the base pattern that you could see with uh, asynchronous communications is that you have a client that's going to register a callback function for every request if it sends to a remote object. So you send, you have a function that you call, we're going to pass a callback function, and when the other responds, then the callback function is going to be called. So if you have sent n requests, then you have n callback functions that have been registered at the time. Callback function in C++, you can use a lambda for passing the remote callback to boost easier your instance. There are many alternatives to this base, basic pattern. One is to have all product functions registered at start of time. Um, that's something that you have in Qt, where you have the single slot mechanism, and then you have signals that you register at the start of time with the slots, and the slots are in fact product functions that are going to be called when a certain signal arrives. So instead of n functions, you just have a single function uh, that can use a switch, uh, to distinguish between the response that when we have uh, all contact functions registered started. Um, so if you have a client program and it uses the services or M service applications, you will have M uh, functions that are have to be registered or M, uh, M times N functions that you have to register if you have a contact for every function. Uh, there's another alternative that's an event driven style where you don't even have kinds of uh, uh, callbacks that you have to register. You have uh, events that are placed in a mailbox. You have a global event loop, and you have a kind of get next event, followed by a switch on the event type. So uh, there's no distinction here between unsolicited uh, events, like the requests from others, and solicited inputs, like responses. And uh, you could say, in fact, that's uh, the use of corresponds to the use of one big callback function. So all these patterns are a little bit related in the sense that you can transform one to the other. Uh, you also have blocking and non-blocking polling instead of uh, using callback functions. That's something that's a style that I have seen in Corba. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have alternatives for to win. So that's are the alternatives that I know, some more alternatives that I know, and those that I that you know. So there's not a single asynchronous style, and that's also one of the problems, that if you change from one company to another, you find another asynchronous style that you use as a product company. So the question would be, can we replace all these uh, uh, different asynchronous styles that have the advantage that they are reactive, uh, that the application is always reactive to the environment, by one single superior style? So, so I have seen, I have the question here, but I don't have put the answer. Um, but you can see the same evolution in C sharp, where they have originally the asynchronous pattern, then they have the uh, event-based asynchronous pattern, and then finally, because they were not pleased with the two previous patterns, they introduced what they call the task-based asynchronous pattern. And in fact, that's the coroutine approach from C sharp. And uh, really the same answer in C++, as is in C++. The coroutines could replace all previous styles of asynchronous, uh, all previous uh, asynchronous styles that are listed here, or that you may have encountered. Uh, at the moment. So, why use coroutines for distributed programming? So that's the big um, menu, the big course for today. So, I use C++ coroutines to write distribute, uh, distributed applications using a synchronous style, but behaving in an efficient, responsive, asynchronous way. So that's why I have uh, introduced uh, synchronous, asynchronous in the previous slides, so that you have an idea what, or the difference between those, and what I mean with, uh, with a synchronous style and an asynchronous style. 
So, all the things, the off the advantages of those styles were not introduced in any in major Disney packages. But something that I claim and that I want to demonstrate in the next steps. So, the callback functions that we have seen in some of those asynchronous styles, they can be hidden inside the code of library. So, the application uh, writer will not see any callback functions anymore. He will see, well, he will use a synchronous style like it was. Uh, with the synchron with the uh, RMI. And I can also use the uh, C coroutines as an alternative to threads. So, because coroutines can run in an interleaved cooperative way uh, on a single operating system. And that's something that I, that I want to stress. Uh, one of the purposes of uh, using coroutines is that I want to avoid all threads that I want to. So, I can say, okay, I have an asynchronous. Uh, uh, application, but everything runs on a single thread. I don't need, I don't need multiple threads. I can do everything on a synchronous, on, a, on one single thread. And still it is reactive and it uses a synchronous style. Uh, there are many other reasons why you could use C++ coroutines for. Uh, I only mentioned those two because for me, that's the two, the two main reasons I use coroutines for. But you can find uh, probably other applications, other persons who have uh, different uh, uh, uses for coroutines. Now, uh, I'm going to give you uh, seven examples that should convince you to use coroutines from now on for, for distributed programming. So if you are not convinced that you should use coroutines for distributed programming, uh, at this moment, I hope you will be convinced at the end of these seven examples. If you are already convinced that you should use coroutines, how uh, the examples that I give maybe can use to convince other people that they should start having a look at coroutines for distributed programming, but maybe also for other uh, applications. So this is a small example. It's the smallest I could think of because I wanted to put a synchronous version, an asynchronous version of the same program and the coroutine version on one slide. So I had to make it short. Uh, there's not much special about it. So we have a function and then a function we call uh, remote method implementation. So I had remote object here, dot operation mom. It has two input parameters and one and two output parameters. There's a synchronous style and it's uh, no different from a local method implication that you would find in C++. You don't see that there's something behind that's going to talk with another application on another machine. It's, it just looks like a normal uh, function implication. The asynchronous style, you will find, again, the remote object. But here you will find a function that I gave a subtype, a different name, that's based on CORBA, the name convention where you have the input parameters, the input arguments in one and in two, and then you pass a lambda. And that lambda is going to be called by uh, your framework when the response arrives to your request. So the part two here, so that's part one code, that I, that's not that's just commented here. You have the part two code, so the part one code is before this statement. Part two code follows, follows the statement. The part two code is going to be placed inside this body of this code function. Let's say one way. When you go to the coroutine version, well, it's let's say the same as this one here, except that I have added co-await here, and that I have added a special return type that I have to proceed. That's async task, and that's something that has been implemented in the coroutine library, or in another library that you have to use when you want to use coroutines. So this, uh, this style and this style are very similar. But yet, this one will uh, execute in a asynchronous way. And that's going to be shown in this slide here. So that's the synchronous version. There's the asynchronous version and there's the coroutine version. So in the, in the synchronous version, what's going to happen when you call that remote method implication? Well, it's going to write first the uh, marshaled uh, in arguments to the 
communication thing. So let's assume that writing doesn't take any time. The reading is going to take some time, but you can't predict. It depends on the other one, uh, writing your, your request, and then the time it takes to read your response, uh, to send the response to you. So here internally, this remote method and the patient can block for some time. And it can be a few seconds. And that's not good for some applications. Let's say it's even unacceptable for some applications. So it doesn't go back to the event loop. In internally in your application, you're blocked until the other one has, has sent your response. When you apply the asynchronous style, it's a little bit more complex. So what has to be done is, uh, well, it corresponds to what you see here on this slide. You're going to split your function, your original function, into two parts. You have your part one, then you're going to start your method authentication. And then you have a second part that's going to be registered as a callback function. So first, you're going to write again to your communication framework. Then you're going to start your read operation. You're not going to read or do a blocking loop. You're going to start your read operation and register your callback function. So that's what's happening here. After you have done that, you're going to return to the main event. Loop. And here in the main event, loop, your application can process any other inputs that are waiting uh, or finally eventually it will receive your response it will uh, pass this as an event to the communication framework and this one will call your callback so this callback here is well going to be called and that's happening in your uh, asynchronous in your asynchronous implementation coroutine version is not that uh, very similar uh, not that very different from this one here so you have also the same flow, but the major difference is that you don't have to split up your function yourself. So you have your start to remote method application, and then you have the call wait on a separate line. So the start here is going to write again. It's going to register, and it's going to start your read, and register your completion handle, or your callback function. Then when you perform the call wait, it says, okay, I don't have an answer yet. And here it's going to be uh, suspend. So it's going to suspend uh, your, your core routine. Going to the event loop, that's the intention. When you suspend that you can go to the event loop. Uh, then when the event arrives with your response, it's going to call your complete completion handler. And this completion handler is responsible for doing the resume here. And then you're going to, to go down here to part two, you're going to the full return. So here, this style and this style are very similar. But because when you are done to this, you don't have to split up your function into, into separate parts. It's going to be done by your compiler. Now, that's one example. Uh, maybe that's not such a yeah. In fact, what's on this slide is just an explanation of what I've done here, of what I have done here. So, that's the explanation that I gave with the picture. Uh, that's again, so that's what uh, the, the function of the, the synchronous style. That's the asynchronous style. And that's with code openings. So, uh, those are these slides with actual ex explanation that I gave you the explanation of showing you the, the pictures. So, example two. So maybe example one was not uh, sufficient to convince you to go to coroutines. This one is a little bit more complex because I have this one here. That's what we've seen in the previous slides. Uh, that's the synchronous version. And then we have two express function calls. So that's a kind of small call stack or protocol stack. It's in the horizontal direction because OK, I have more place in the horizontal direction. And it's also easier to call uh, to, to show the call and the return the relationships. So here we have a function that we call at the top of the stack. So we call this function. It's going here. This function is going to call function 2, going over here. Function 3, and it's uh, going over here. And then we have, again, the write and the read. So this read can block for a few seconds. And then when the read has completed, we're going to return here. So that's the uh, 
of the to be returned. This one is going to be returned and this is going to return. So that's a normal uh, remote method implementation with normal function calls. Nothing uh, asynchronous, just synchronous time. Easy to read, easy to write, except here we may have been blocked for a few seconds and uh, that's maybe unacceptable for, for, unacceptable for some of the cases. Next slide has uh, the asynchronous style. So here we're going to restore the activity, but there's a big price to pay accordingly. So we have this split up already of the function one in two parts, function two in two parts, and also here. So this part we have already seen on the a few slides before. So we're going to call this, this is going to call function two, this is going to call this function. Here we have the right again. We're going to start the reading and register the callback. And then we're going to return from here to this function, this function, going to the event loop, and uh, eventually we'll get an event uh, with a response. We're going to call this callback function. That's what we've seen a few slides before. But now what we have to do is also to go back from here to this function, because this part also has to be accomplished. And we have to go back to this one here. And that's more complex, complicated because these functions have returned and this function doesn't, doesn't know where it, where, where it has been called to. So what can be done or what has to be done is when you go in the forward direction is that you pass information from one layer to another layer about the function that has to be called up. So you're going to register in that for the information about this called back function. You're going to pass it to this function this function has to, pa to pass it to this one here, and so on. So that this one, when this function is called from, uh, from your communication framework, it can call back this function, and it can uh, call back this function. So that's something you have to implement manually yourself. Something that, yes. Johan, yes? your mouse pointer is not visible, so oh, maybe... Sorry. Yeah. Refer to the function name. Ah, yes, okay. Okay, uh, yes. So, sorry, I stole my mouse was possible. So, we had uh, under function three, we have the callback function that's called. And that's the, the callback function under function three has to uh, call the callback function under function two. And then um, again to the callback function in the, in the function one. So we have the past information about those callback functions from function one to function two and then from function two to function three. Otherwise we can go back in the direction from the right to the left. And that's something you have to implement yourself when you do asynchronous uh, communicate uh, is when you use the asynchronous trap. Now the next one is with coroutines. And here, the passing of information from the left to the right and from the right so that the right can go back to the left is all done by the coroutines implementation. You don't have to provide information yourself when you call from coroutine 1 to coroutine 2 or from coroutine 2 to coroutine 3. That's something that's going to be handled by your coroutine implementation and by uh, uh, the, the coro lib library in this case. So you can use a very natural style without worrying about passing information about callbacks from one to the other. In fact, at your application level, you don't see any callbacks anymore because the completion handle that you see to the right is in fact something that's part of the uh, of the coroutine library. So you don't have to write your com uh, completion handle yourself. Uh, it's in the it's internally in the core in the core uh, library. So that's the style you can have that uh, when you use coroutines. It's very similar to the style of synchronous application, except that uh, going forward and backward is all done now uh, by means of suspend and resume. So in the middle, at the, the call weight level, you see suspense going from the right to the left. And you also see resumes going from the right to the left. Uh, when you do it with functions, you only have calls and returns. 
So you have to do everything with pause and request. Here you have the suspense and the resumes of doing the hard work for you. In fact, what uh, coroutines are doing is in fact splitting up your, uh, your function into parts that can be executed separately, like you have done manually with your uh, callback functions, except that the work is for the coroutine library and for the compiler. Co so that's the explanation of the previous three slides. Explanation in words. Quite a bit, uh, what you have seen passing information from the left to the right. Uh, it's something that you also see in driver stacks when you have perps in the Windows driver model. That's passing information from the top of your stack to the bottom so that it can go back from the top or uh, from the bottom to the top. Or here in uh, my previous pictures, it's from the left to the right and from the right to the left. I have still more uh, of these things. And that's slide 29, 70. Yeah. Uh, that's it. Uh, so I have to speed up a little bit. Uh, that's another example. But here I have three uh, remote method implications instead of one. Uh, this code is in uh, the coroutine library as one of the examples. It's under a subdirectory called wild coroutines. So it's not only code that compiles, it's also something that you can run. So it's just taken from this. On the left, you have the, the synchronous and asynchronous time. Uh, the synchronous time. Here you have the asynchronous time. I need already more code because here you have three lambdas. And then uh, but these lambdas are calling functions, separate functions. Uh, so this originally function one has been split into three and two. In fact, four parts here, function 1, function 1a, one 1a, uh, one function 1b, one, one and function 1c. So that's something you have to do yourself when you write, uh, when you want to convert this synchronous style to an asynchronous style. Uh, that's how it looks like when you do it, uh, so that's a synchronous style. On the right, you have this, uh, the asynchronous style, where you have to split up your original function in parts. So this function here, is going to start the RMI, and then this callback function is going to the handle the response of that uh, start. Uh, it's going to call part two, then start RMI, and then part three, and so on. So you have to use some scissors to cut up your original function uh, on the left uh, to have those four parts on the right. Um, I don't have a picture for the coroutine style because, in fact, it's very similar to the synchronous style that we uh, That's the coroutine code. So uh, this one on the left here is very similar to what we have seen in the synchronous style, apart from the co-weight and the async class that we have. Uh, this one is a little bit more um, in two parts on the right, where we have first the... Uh, uh, this task that I start, and then I do the code uh, on, a, on another line. So that we can do some step in between launching the asynchronous application, uh, the asynchronous operation, and uh, before we do the code. So that we have three lines here instead of one. Because when I start uh, a remote application, maybe I can already do some useful stuff before I receive the response, before I do, do wait on the response. So that's another advantage of using coroutines. You can start a remote uh, remote uh, method, uh, and then when you're ready, you can wait for it. Um, another here we have I only have the synchronous style on the left and the asynchronous style. Suppose we have a function with three remote method implications, uh, one, two, and three. Uh, in fact, you could uh, Say so you can start them in parallel, but uh, with the blocking uh, synchronous in the synchronous implementation, it won't work. So the remote method implementation one will take three seconds, this, the other one two, the other one five, and so you have to add up those delays for each of them. When you start them in parallel or in an asynchronous way, you can start the remote method implementation. 
we can start the second one, start, start the third one. And then when the reply uh, is received, you can ask, okay, is the re reply already received for the other two? And if you have the, received the replies for the for everybody, you go on that part two that you see on the on the bottom. That's again the explanation. So you can gain a lot of time here uh, by splitting this up, but the split has to be done manually yourself. Uh, you can do it with coroutines and then to wait for the response of those three uh, remote method applications, you have to use co-await uh, when all, and that's something you will see in the coroutine monitor. So, I have some more examples. That's a function with the RMI and in the loop. Okay, so on the left, you have just a for loop in a for loop, but then a remote method application in the end of it. Very natural style, but if this remote method applications take a few seconds, well, it can be blocked for a long time because you have a for and a for, and a, it can take seconds or even minutes before this is accomplished and before you return from function one. I don't have an asynchronous implementation for this one, but in coroutines, it looks like this. And what will happen is that at every co await you can return uh, to your main event group, where you can process other events, or you will uh, receive the response for your, to, your, uh, to your request. And then you will return and you resume from that co -await. So it's very simple to return this in responsive uh, synchronous style application on the left to the one on the right. Just a few uh, additional words, and it's going to execute in an asynchronous way. You don't have to rewrite anything because if you have, have something like a for and a for, uh, a lesson with a for loop and a for loop, and you have to turn it into an asynchronous uh, style, well, you won't re recognize your for loops anymore. I guess some of you have already. I did in the past, we have to do it like that. Uh, but it's going to be a long way, long, some work, and you won't uh, recognize the curves anymore. Uh, I use coroutines as an alternative to threads. Uh, so I can say, okay, you want thread behavior, I can give you thread behavior, but with coroutines. So we have two measurement loops. Uh, that's for an, ex an example that I have in, in the group library. So and those are going to run interleaved. So the task here, task T1 and T2, they are going to run in an interleaved way, uh, as if they are separate bits. And then I do wait all. Uh, this it should be when all because I have changed the limitation. Then you can uh, wait. Uh, can you wait until task one and task two uh, have. Uh, so again, if you have to do this uh, with in an asynchronous style, it will take you a lot of work to to, be, to do this. Except, of course, if you say I'm going to use threads and run uh, those two measurement loops on, on a separate thread. But I can say, okay, you can do the same. Uh, you can have the same behavior just with coroutines without any addition. Uh, okay. Then I have coroutines and alternative things that uh, the previous slides, so that's an explanation word. Um, we have an example of embedded software that we can skip uh, because sometimes in embedded software we, don't, we only have one single uh, application, uh, one single program, no operating system, but sometimes there's a kernel that you use. Well, if you for uh, having threads, but again, maybe you don't have to include that real-time kernel if you can have uh, uh, thread behavior using coroutines. So, I have made a small concluding um, slide in this. We have synchronous and asynchronous. You have single thread and a multi thread. The advantages of both of them. Uh, so, synchronous, single thread, it's easy to read. Multi-threaded, you have the thread overhead. Uh, and asynchronous multi-threaded, yeah. 
I just wonder what I want to do with this slide. Just make a comparison between those and stuff. So that's about all. Uh, I don't know if you're convinced that uh, you should have a look at core things uh, to replace all those synchronous styles that give you a lot of work to rewrite from a synchronous style to an asynchronous style. Well, you can do everything with coroutines. Uh, and now we're going to see a little bit about coroutines. I still have only five minutes left, <laughs> uh, or a little bit more. So the, uh, and now we're going to coroutine Coral itself. So the goal of Coralip is to implement the synchronous coroutine library that can be used to write asynchronous distributed applications, but uses a synchronous style. Mm -hmm. So what we've seen in the previous pictures, it's that's the goal of uh, Coralip. Uh, keep your synchronous style, do a few modifications, but have a responsibly synchronous way of execution without uh, having to rewrite your program. Uh, also demonstrated that it can be used with existing asynchronous communication frameworks, like you have Boost ASIO or Q5 or any proprietary communication stack that you, com that you may have seen in the past. Uh, it's meant as something that you can put on, on top of it without changing your, your asynchronous communication framework. But by using that, by using that uh, protein uh, layer, layer, you can uh, rewrite your uh, original asynchronous style application into a more natural synchronous style application. Also demonstrate that you can use it to replace threads because uh, my goal is to say, okay, if I want to run everything I want that I can do it and it's going to be reactive. Uh, I don't need threads to make my application reactive or to keep the original uh, algorithm as it was. Also, I wanted to make it simple so that you can learn how coroutines work. So it's still simple enough uh, to learn coroutines, even if you can also use it for as a layer on top of, uh, let's say, boost or output. Um, that's about uh, the style I prefer. So we have a start operation. It's going to return an async operation object, so that's something you can find in the, in the library. And then you can do all things that you need to do before receiving the answer. So afterwards, if you have done everything that uh, and you need the answer, finally you can call the call wait. Um, and then you can proceed. So I prefer to start with birth here in two lines instead of the one below. Although you can use it uh, the one below as well. You can put everything on one line. Uh, but if you want, you can uh, just, uh, just put it in two lines. Uh, the advantage is also when you're learning coroutines, you know, you can see what this uh, function on top is returning. So it's returning async operation. Uh, so you can look in the code, see how that async operation is implemented. Uh, something that you don't see if you use the second alternative, you don't see what that uh, proxy with that uh, operation returns. You just have the code wait, uh, but you don't see the, the inter intermediate uh, object. So both styles, they have pros and cons, but uh, in Corolip, you can choose the both, whatever you want. And in Boost, you can only use the second style, because Boost doesn't allow you to uh, to, to, do, to split it in two lines. Uh, it's something to do with uh, private constructors. So that was a disappointment when, when I was experimenting with, uh, with uh, the boost, the first thing I tried was to split, split it into two lines to see what's the outcome of the first operation. Uh, but that's not allowed in boost. So you have to put everything in one line with the code root uh, and the return value. So the core uh, organization. Um, so I have a few classes, only a few. Uh, I guess you can do everything with certain classes. The two major classes are async operation and async task. And an async operation does not have a promise type. So here you have to have some uh, knowledge of the code. It does have a promise type. It does define an operator call rate. I use uh, async operation as a return type uh, from going from the no non-coding word 
to the code that you wrote. So that's something that's, uh, let's say, the, it's used uh, to interact with the libraries, with communication. I have async task that does have a promise type, and does have a full uh, rate operator. So that's something that you that you need to use in coroutines, as you can't have a coroutines. I have a, a, a rate, a one-way task. It does have a promise type, uh, but it doesn't define the uh, you know, operator call rate. It's a type, it's a class that I found in CPP Coro, but it was somewhere hidden in a, in a bigger file. But I say, okay, it deserves a class of its own, it deserves a file of its own. So, putting this in, uh, in one, in one uh, diagram, we have async operation, we have async weight, we have one way task. So, we see have, we also have a combination where we have no promise type and no operation call weight. But that's nothing special, that's any class or script that we have used up till now. While here, one way task is using a promise type with no operation call weight. And then we have the weights, uh, sync weight. No, it's a sync task. Uh, it's a sync task that using an operator call weight and then using promise type. So there's also some small errors in this case. Uh, we have when all, when any, that's something that you need when you want to wait for the result of multiple operations, or when you want to select the result of only one operation. Then we have auxiliary classes, so secondary classes that are still independent of using the P5. Those two, you don't uh, use them directly, they are used in the implementation of when all, when any, missing operation in the same task. We have an auto reset event that's also not really necessary I use it in some uh, applications, in some examples, but you don't really need it. I have a semaphore, but it's uh, something that can be avoided in C plus twenty, because C plus plus twenty has semaphores on it itself, uh, and it's it's used, of course, in uh, examples that I where I do use it. And then I have a print and uh, a dedicated print that's going to print the logical thread ID. Uh, so that they, you can verify that I'm a, or that I can verify that I'm only using one bit and you just want to use one bit. Okay, we have done the communication classes. That's a uh, communication class rules from service. That's a base class. It's not very independent. We have com call. That's the common uh, functionality for, for client and server. So we have writing, start writing, start reading, start time, we have com client, communication client. So that's going to start from doing the start connect. And we have the server side that's doing the start exit. So typical things you can start, you can expect from uh, uh, client and server applications where you have where the client has to connect to a server and the server has to accept your, uh, your connection. Good five. Uh, there are some classes that they use that are independent of coroutines, the TCP client, the TCP server. So that's uh, good five, but no coroutines. We have the TCP client go, so the post is a coroutine. And here I have added uh, coroutine uh, implementations. I'm going to take maybe 10 more minutes. Is that okay for you? Yes. Ten, ten. I want to explain. Yes. I'm going to explain the basic pattern that you will find in the codes. So something that repeats itself and that's uh, useful to see. Uh, so on the left you have an async operation, where you do start reading. On the other hand, on the other side you have a start reading implementation. So the start reading on the left is very short. Uh, it's going to call the the function on the right. Start reading implementation, and this one you will find typical boost. So you have boost is your async uh, read until where you're going to pass your lambda function. So the lambda on the, is on the right and it's uh, the, it's in the independent of, in, of, any, of any application logic. What you will see in the, in the lambda is that it's going to call back or it's going to set the result in an async operation objects. 
So that's what you see in the level and the yellow on the right. It needs a point to this incorporation object, on which it can represent the results and on which it can call completed. So we need a point in the lambda function. Um, and there, I had the problem that on the left, I declared an object, this incorporation, but uh, I can't pass the address to the start reading implementation function. Well, I can do it, I can pass it, but uh, when I pass it to the lambda, you see that the function on the left will start reading will return. So the address of the object, the red object, return object, will change after it's returned. So I've passed, when I would pass the address of that uh, red object uh, inside the start reading implementation, it will not be valid anymore in the lambda. So the lambda, when it's called by the, by the boost framework, it will have a, uh, an incorrect address uh, of, uh, of the async operation object. So what I do, instead of passing the address directly, I, uh, I have an index into array. So with the get free index, I get a free index that I can pass uh, to the lambda and that uh, index is going to be used because that's uh, to define by the address. So what we'll see here, so that's an explanation of text. Uh, the problem that I just explained, and that's the result here for the, the solution. We have the async operation here. So on the right, we have the lambda that is going to go completed on that async operation. And that async operation object is going to uh, resume the coroutine. But uh, alt co awaiting it. I can't use the address directly of the, of the async operation object. So what I do is I use the index into an array on the left, and that index and that array has a pointer to the async operation that we see on the right. So that's the way to go from the lambda via the index into an array uh, to the address of the async operation. And if the async operation object is moved, because it's moved uh, when it's uh, returned from that uh, first function on the left, the one of the previous types, it's going to change its address in the array. So the address is going to be stable and uh, usable by the lambda function. So that's what I want to explain that this pattern here that you will find, uh, it's going to be repeated in the code of the corollary. It's always the same pattern that's returning. Uh, you have the index, and, but the reason why I use this with an index is just because of uh, the problem that I had when you, that the facing operation is moved. Uh, when the, when the uh, this function here, that starts reading from some points. Okay. That's all about uh, the, a little bit about the, the internals of the Corolip library, of the pattern that's returning. I have examples. Uh, that was already rather short from the beginning. Uh, I was a little bit short of inspiration to get the names. So it's client server one, client server two. Uh, so those are the example libraries uh, that you can use, or the example application that you can use. Uh, client server 11 is, um, is because of Q, so I made the jump from the uh, R to 11. Because here, the first four is, are using boost, and the other ones are using uh, Q. I have uh, some examples, various boost and various Q, uh, that don't, that are single, uh, that uh, are using timers, uh, but it's only a single application, so it's not client server. And then I have some small examples, not using use of two, but smaller. Uh, they are small, but uh, there are many of them. We have uh, the tutorial. Uh, and that's something without, that you can use without boost or without Qt. So you don't have to install Qt or boost. You can run the, uh, you can build the, the, the tutorials without these libraries installed. And it's something that if you don't know coordinates now, you can use Corolip together with the tutorial to learn about uh, coroutines. That's the information. Uh, why coroutines? In fact, those are the examples uh, that I used in, uh, in the previous uh, big chunk 
about uh, my promotion of coding to replace asynchronous style of business. Uh, I recently added, uh, that means on Sunday, uh, something that I called Coro Up, Coro Team Library. And those are examples that I've uh, used for the, for the presentation the 29th of January 2020. It was for the budget six years ago. Uh, I have not changed anything to the code since the 1st of February 2020. So I just uh, put the same code uh, as I presented to the budget six years user group inside Corolla. Uh, one thing is that uh, Every example is complete in the sense that every code that you need uh, is, in the, is, in the, is in the sample and the single file. So every so there's going to be some repetition between files. But if you want to study how code things work, well, you just need that, that file, and that file will uh, show you one complete example of uh, how we are using code things in one or the other. It was also the basic for uh, basis of development. For developing Corolla. Uh, here I have some uh, fancy examples of my application, two applications. I have a strange notion of fanciness. So those are, the, that's uh, fancy because it's using four uh, command prompts. The less fancy examples use only two or more. So here we have an example of client server, one application. That's on the left, we have two clients. In the upper right, we have the client server, and then we have the final server on the right. If you look on the left, it's a little bit slow, maybe uh, a little bit small, but we have here zero, zero. So that's the thread number. So here I can prove that everything runs on one thread. That's a zero, so that, that's a, thread, a logical thread number. So that's something I have to verify for myself that indeed I only use one thread because I only want to use one thread. Let's to demonstrate that indeed I achieve this behavior. Uh, that's for uh, client server 11. That's uh, using Qt. So we have two servers on the right. I have to start because the client is using two servers. And it's going to run that uh, measurement loop 40 on two servers. So the uh, server on the upper right and the server on the, uh, on the, on the lower right. So then on the left, you have the client, and it's going to communicate with the two servers, uh, and it's going to execute a loop in the loop. Where it then from that in the loop is going to call the server. So some related work. Um, I made a small comparison between CPP Coro and Corolli. Uh, when uh, experimenting and when learning about Corolli, I had a look at CPP Coro. Uh, CPP, CPP Coro, which is, let's say, the, mis, the most famous Coro thing hybrid that I know of now. Uh, there's a link to here. Uh, so I learned a lot of that. You can also use this one uh, as a learning tool. It's much bigger than my Coro lib, uh, but it maybe it's also more complex to learn. So maybe a starting point because it's for learning Coro thing is Coro lib because it's only in some, very small compared to CPP code. There are other uh, reasons for, uh, for other differences or other goals of both libraries. I wanted to be to use Boost as communication email because Boost runs on both uh, Windows and Linux, while uh, Lewis Baker was using CPP overlap input output, which is difficult for Windows. Now. Then we have Boost ASU comparison with Corolib. So uh, originally I wanted to use Boost Asia, but then I said, okay, I, I have to use online co uh, wait. Let me see. It's not possible to spread this one, the result co wait async operation, into two lines. It was not, uh, and I wanted to do this because that's also the style I've seen in uh, C sharp. So that's why uh, I started developing my own code with the then presentation of budget CPP is user group. You can find uh, the slides and also the, the code over there. Then some books. Uh, there's a lot of articles. Uh, that's a good uh, reference because you have five articles. I've also seen that uh, Jens shared it uh, some days ago. There are some books. Uh, that's a book I have. 
vote recently, chapter 18 is on C++ code and so on. And then we have C++ 20, get the details at the end over there. There are some other books, but uh, those two books uh, have chapters or sections on code, and the code is important. Um, okay, finalizing. So, that's my last slide. Coroutines are very useful to write distributed and many other applications. I hope I could convince you with my presentation that you should have a look at coroutines. Uh, if you want to write uh, or you have to turn uh, distributed uh, applications, um, they can lead to a more uniform coding style among different types of applications. So if you have standard over applications running long running complex algorithms, well, you could run them on, on a track, but it's not necessary anymore if you have coroutines. Uh, if you have distributed applications with communicating processes, you can use coroutines for re uh, reactive real-time and embedded applications. Uh, you can reduce the number of threads when you use coroutines. So my goal is always to reduce a single thread. So uh, by saying, okay, if you have multiple threads, I can replace everything by coroutines and they will behave as if they were threads. So coroutines can be used as an alternative to threads. And they are fun, so uh, it's a hobby project still. Uh, and uh, it's a hobby because I still amuse myself with, uh, with uh, coroutines and what they, they can do. The, in my opinion, they are an essential, an essential part of the future of programming, and they should have been there already a long time ago. So uh, I wish they were there already 40 years ago when I started writing software. Then uh, maybe I've I would have not have seen so many different styles of asynchronous uh, applications. So to me, everybody should learn and use coroutines from now on. So that was all. Uh, sorry for taking more of than one hour of your time. Thank you for your talk. Um, that was really interesting and very good slides. Um, I think we're going to change now to Hubido to the room, yeah. and then going to you know have uh, answering any questions and um, going through your slides again. Uh, very interesting presentation. Thank you, Johan. Thank you.